I don't know, Josh, just had you standing for that last song, but we might be up and standing for the reading of the word of the Lord again this morning, and then I'll let you sit for the rest of the service, I promise. John chapter 1, verse 45. Philip findeth, him, findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. And we'll have a word of prayer this morning that the Lord might help us. My Lord and King, we do thank you and praise you. And we just want to again humble ourselves before you. As I stand here to preach, Lord, I pray you'd help me. As uh, we gather around your word, I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to each and every heart. And my Lord, I pray that your spirit might have free course. I ask, Lord, that you would see fit, that there wouldn't be a one of us that would uh, hinder your spirit, would quench your spirit, but would allow you to have free course in each and every area of our lives. We do thank you and praise you. I ask you to help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. Nathaniel was witness to. Philip came to Nathaniel and said, I have found the way, the truth, and the life. And he's come out of Nazareth. And Nathaniel's response was, Well, that don't make no sense to me. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? A lot could be said about this for the gospel's sake. You know, we live in a day and age where Western society is probably as biblically illiterate as it ever has been. There's probably never been a time in Western history where society has known so little of what the Bible is about. Yet, every man and his dog has already formed an opinion that it's no help to them. The Bible's been such an ingrained part of our history across Western society, that the general man or woman out in the street has decided that no good thing can come out of Christianity. No good thing can come out of that history, that tradition. I shouldn't, and, and they just leave it alone. A lot could be said drawing parallels to the Gospel here. And Nathaniel, for whatever his reasoning was, he looked at Nazareth and went, I doubt it. I was talking to a friend, uh, a friend just yesterday about the about the uh, reputation that Weeper and Karumba used to have. And he ran a story by me about Karumba, and I thought, man, I'd forgotten about that story. I'd never been there in my life. But there's all these stories about Karumba and the places up there and what it was like in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And it's like, can any good thing <laughs> come out of the Gulf? Um, that, was the <laughs> that, was the, that was the question that Nathaniel had. There was this location in his head that he went, oh, nothing good can come out of there. And Philip said to him, come and see. And what a beautiful little gospel message. What a little beautiful little way of presenting the gospel to somebody. I found the answer. And when they give their arguments, you know what you say? Come and see. If we, re if we truly believe that God is as big and powerful as His Word promises that He is, then all we need is mankind to come and see, and then they'll make their choice about what they'll do. God will reveal Himself unto the hearts of man. It's given to us to go into all the world and preach the Gospel. And the Spirit and the Bride say, come. That's our job, the Bride of Christ. To say, Come unto Christ. But I don't want to look at this passage so much as a gospel message. Just consider a little of the, the context here. If we keep reading, Jesus saw Nathanael in verse 47. He saw him coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered, 
and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And we spent a little time on this last week about the Lord's knowledge of us, that before we ever see God, He's already seen us. Before we were mindful of Him, He has been mindful of us. And here's Nathaniel's example of that in a very personal way. Nathaniel answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. You know what you need? Yes, you need John 3.16. Yes, you need the, 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 the law and the prophets. Yes, you need the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need the truth of God's Word given to you. But what you also need is this moment that Nathaniel had where Christ reached on down out of heaven, so to speak, and just pointed to an occurrence in Nathaniel's life and said, I want to bring all these truths and apply them to you, Nathaniel. It wasn't the law and the prophets that convinced Nathaniel. That just gave him questions and skepticism. It was Christ's knowledge of him under the fig tree that had Nathaniel go, now I see. Don't get me wrong. You need to teach the law and the prophets. You need to feed the Bible into your children and into your grandchildren. And you need to give the Bible to the lost around you. You need to teach them the Word of God. You need to go into all the world and be, be that witness. Be a city set on a hill. But you know what's needed in that lost loved one's life? They need to see that Christ saw them under the fig tree. They need that personal conversation with the living Word of God that says, Before Philip brought thee, I saw thee. I knew thee. You need to pray that they would hear that still and quiet voice. And have confidence that the Lord is at work. When was the first time? When, when was the first time that we know that Christ had any interaction with Paul of Tarsus, with Saul of Tarsus? On the road to Damascus, right? On the road to Damascus. Everyone else, everyone else thought he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees that there was no room at all for him to have any doubt or any pricking or anything, that the Lord was, that he was just dead to the things of God. But the, 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 you know what Jesus said to him? He said, Paul, it's, he said, I just haven't been kick, pricking you, but it's been getting hard for you to kick against the pricks. There's been a personal relationship going on between Christ and Paul long before ever he got on that road to Damascus. You know, have confidence in the promises of God that He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to, to repentance. And if a soul that you love dies and goes to hell, it's not because Christ hasn't been pricking them and prodding them, but it's because they've belligerently remained disobedient to the Word of God. God is at work this morning. God's at work in your life, at my life. God's in work in the life of this world around us. And you take your loved ones and you lay them before the, the throne of grace and you just in the trust in the promises of God's Word. That He's at work in their lives. Long before you ever thought of them, Christ had thought of them. And so here we have that personal interaction that Nathaniel had with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, I want you to catch this. I want you to catch what Jesus said is coming out of Nazareth. You remember Nathaniel said what good thing could come out of Nazareth? Jesus is about to tell him what good thing can come out of Nazareth. Here it is. Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Remember Jacob's vision? He saw the angels ascending and descending on that ladder. Jesus said, I am that ladder. I am the mediator, the bridge between heaven and earth. You know what you're going to see? Nathaniel, you're going to see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He said, let me tell you what comes out of Nazareth. 
the salvation of God for all of mankind and the condescending of heaven down onto earth and the, the ability for ministering spirits to, to minister unto man the coming and going of heaven on this earth of those angels of God. Here's Jesus' answer. But Nathaniel's question is not unreasonable. Go with me to John chapter 7. He's not the only one that had this conclusion. Many that knew the Word of God came to this conclusion. John chapter 7 and verse 40. Now I understand that the, the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, they get a, we look at the priesthood in Jesus' day and we tut tut, don't we? We are. Look at that priesthood. Look at them scribes and then Pharisees. And granted, the majority of them were troubled. But there was a man named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. That was his tribe. That was his crowd. Right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, there was a, a, a leader, a ruler of the Jews that had a heart that was open. Right at the end of Jesus' ministry, Joseph of Arimathea was of that elite crowd. And if we go prior to it, do you remember John the Baptist's dad? The priesthood. They knew the Bible. The scribes, they knew the Bible. I granted there was, generally speaking, they were troubled. But there were those amongst them that were not. In fact, the Bible repeatedly says that many of them believed. And here in John chapter 7, verse 40, we'll pick up the reading. And the many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, uh, the, the saying that Jesus had just made, uh, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said... This is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? I mean, never, not, ne never mind Nazareth. They just went, what good thing's coming out of Queensland? They just, like, there's nothing coming out. Never mind what's going to come out of Nazareth. There ain't no prophet coming out of Galilee. That whole region, there is no promise attached to it. That whole region, there is no reason to expect that the Son of God, that the Christ, the promised Messiah, was coming out of there. They knew their Bible. They knew the Old Testament. And they, they brought this argument. That, where's it? Where's it going? They, there's nothing coming out of Galilee. Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the Scriptures said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? You know where Bethlehem is? Bethlehem's just out of Jerusalem. You know where Jerusalem is? Way down Judea, the bottom end of the country, down near the Dead Sea, not up near the Lake of Galilee. They knew where Christ was to come from. They knew where the Christ was to come from. Verse 43, So there was a division among the people because of Him. And some of them would have taken Him, but no man laid hands on Him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? Well, the answer becomes yes. But have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed upon him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night being one of them, doth, sorry, but these people, but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, speaking of he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. You get this, this place of Galilee. It's a place that's of, it's derided. It's a fisherman's village. It's not where the Son of Man's going to come from. It's not where the Messiah is coming from. See, they, they knew their Bible. They knew their Old Testament, but they didn't know Christ. 
Yeah, we're so, we've got 2,000 years of, of reading the first few chapters of Luke that it just becomes nonplus. Just, yeah, of course, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We've been singing about that every Christmas. But we know it because it was written. These Pharisees, they didn't, they didn't know where he come from. Graham, where was Ian born? You've known him for a while. <laughs> just, a, just a wild guess, right? We don't know, really. Like, he knows. I'd take a guess or two. And that was cruel and unusual punishment. I get that, just calling someone out like that. But my whole point being, we know each other, but there's stuff we don't know, right? It's not unusual for the Pharisees not to know where some fella that's wandering around teaching people was born. And so they went, no, this can't be him. They just ruled him out. Just as, just as Nathaniel did. Went, Nazareth? What good's coming out of Nazareth? Never mind Nazareth, what's coming out of Galilee? You know what's funny? In John chapter 21, verse 2, we find out where Nathaniel was from. Cana, 3K down the road from Nazareth. You know, it's like living at Tanham and going, what good thing can come out of Boyne Island? <laughs> it's like living in Gladstone and going, what good thing can come out of Benarabi? Now, I well understand what good thing can come out of Gladstone. Like, I get that. But the other way around? <laughs> that's, that's what's going on here. And he's just, he's like... And, and it seems to be more than just state of origin rivalry. It seems to be a genuine recognition that, you know, that area where I'm from, Cana, just down the road from Nazareth. Nazareth, just there, midst of Cana, midst of Galilee. There's nothing there for God to use. There's nothing there that any good is going to come from. We need to look to Jerusalem where the temple is. That's where we look for the things of God. We need to look to these other places. There's this, there's this negativity attached. Go with me to, Luke, uh, to John chapter 2. What good thing comes out of Nazareth? What good thing comes out of Galilee? Gospel of John chapter 2. The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Just three days after this interaction, no, probably just the next day, I've got my schedule in wrong. They land down in this very neck of the woods. There at Cana, just outside of Nazareth. And the Bible says both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And it's probably, it's you know, as you read this, this account, Mary obviously has some fairly uh, substantial role in this marriage. That Jesus is, is being um, invited there. Then, and it says his disciples, but you know, it's where Nathaniel's from, so na perhaps Nathaniel's invited, not, not because he's a disciple of Christ, but because he's of Cana and family friend. We're just not given any of those details. We don't know. But we do know that they were there and they, they were bid to come to this, to this wedding. And the Bible says in verse 3, When they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And his mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Here was the problem. They went to Cana and it's not just coincidence that we're still, in, still down in Galilee right there in that neck of the woods. It's no coincidence that Nathaniel was there. And you know what? It's possible that Nathaniel was going to be there whether he met Jesus or not. It's possible. And here they are and he's there with Christ as one of his disciples. 
We probably only have the two disciples named of Philip and Nathaniel. <clears throat> and they start running out of wine. And in verse 6, there was set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. Go with me just to understand this. Go to Mark chapter 7. Look, we could go to history, we could go to geology, we could go all these things, but I tell you, look, there's a couple of verses here that just help us understand what was going on without us having to dig everywhere else. Let just this one verse here in, in Mark chapter 7, find your place in verse 3. The Bible says that the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. This water pots, after the purifying of the Jews as their custom was, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, what is that? Unless they wash their hands often, they're not going to eat. You know what that means? That means they're often washing their hands. That means whilst they're eating, they're washing their hands. I tell you what, I've never had to... There's things that once you get a beard, there's things that you've got to be careful about eating. Right? You sit me down with a burger, I'm up and down with napkins and with washing. and just You've got to be careful. With the Jews, they sit down to eat and they're often washing. How often? I don't know. But it's a marriage feast. It's not just a five-minute meal. And so here's these water pots set out. And they're big. It says there's, there's, they're called a, a firkin. And, and that's, they reckon that's about, the, uh, about 40 liters. Um, sorry, about um, that a firkin is about 40 liters. And there was two or three firkins of water apiece for these, um, these big stone Vases is what the Greeks would have called, I forgot the name, what is it, an amphora. Those big tall vases that you see, um, you know, you see them in people's houses in their doorway with some dead sticks standing in them nowadays, right? <laughs> you know the ones? Um, someone's probably got one, that's all right. Just, that's, that's what a picture nowadays. Um, <clears throat> and so we're talking in each pot, you know, uh, probably 80 to 120 litres. There's six of them. We're talking somewhere between, you know, five to 700 litres of water amongst all of these pots as they're filled up. Um, not even going to deal with the, the, the alcohol side of it. Just do a study on the word wine and you'll see it covers everything from, from, uh, from jam through to grape juice through to fermented wines. Um, and so there's, there's no reason for this to be anything other than just uh, grape juice, but that's beside the point. All these pots of water, what are they there for? For the manner of the purifying of the Jews. You have a wedding feast, you have people needing to wash their hands, and you're 2,000 years ago, so the Davy pump isn't working out the back to turn the tap on and off. So you've got all these pots set out so people can just come and wash their hands. And I don't know whether they scooped it out, but you scoop it out, you're going to have a mud hole on the floor. And I don't know how they did it, but there's all these practicalities. But the whole purpose of this, it's the bathroom. It's the place to wash your hands. It's the kitchen sink. It's, it's the garden tap. You know, all those places when you're at dinner time and you've got to wash because the prawn juice is to your elbows. And so everyone's coming and going. And this is off the back of Jesus being accused quietly off the back of what good thing can come out of Nazareth. Jesus' mother says, we've run out of wine. And now we're talking about water pots for washing your hands. Just let me ask you something. Have you ever turned around and looked at your circumstance and gone, what good thing can come out of this? What good can come out of my life, my history? 
Look at what I am. I'm just a dirty water pot. I'm just a dope from Nazareth. Look at my history. Look at my present situation. Have you ever looked, have you ever looked at yourself and, and stood there and gone, you know what? This is just the off-scouring of the world sitting right here. When I look at myself at the way mum and ra dad raised me or at what I've been taught in church or at the things I know that are right and good and I look at myself in the mirror and I go, I'm none of those things. I'm just filthy. I look and every area of my life is just broken and destitute. There's just things that aren't how they're supposed to be. There's all these things wrong. And when it really comes down to it, you look at your life and go, it's just a mess. And then on top of that, on top of that, you look at the world around you and there's a need. Do you know what wine is a picture of in the Bible consistently? Of sacrifice and particularly of suffering because of the way it came through the wine press and specifically of the blood of Christ. And if we just if we just have a look at this picture with a spiritual mindset, we've got a world that's needing the blood of Christ and it seems to have run out of it. Not that the blood of Christ has run short, it's just not there for the world to get at. And when Christ turns around looking for something, what does He find? You. In all your filthiness. In all your failings. He turns around and He finds me. In all of my error, in all of my wrong, all of the filth of the weak gone, just washed on, not just onto me, but into me. You ever, you ever been driving down the road and go, man, what am I singing? Where did that song come from? Why am I, why am I running those lyrics through my head? What am I thinking? Where did that image come from? What, you ever get in an argument and off the back of an argument you take a look at your heart and you go, how did I think those things against that person whom I love? We find ourselves not just outwardly not right, but inwardly filthy. Like these water pots. And I want you to, I mean, I know you know the story. I know you know what happened here. But read with me again. There were six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying the Jews taking, containing two or three firkins apiece. And Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. There wasn't... The, Jesus didn't even take that water Himself. He said to these servants, He said, I want you to draw out the water. And I want you to go give it to the head huncho. You understand what happens? They're like, okay. And this is why we know Mary's carrying some weight because they're doing this off her authority. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. And so they took, they, they took water out of, the, out of the sink and they took it to the the governor of the feast, the equivalent in our day would be the father of the bride who has just paid for this whole thing and sorted this whole thing and, and watching this whole thing. 
governor of the feast, maybe it was the mother of the bride, but either which way, right, took, took it there, knowing where they got it from and knowing where it was going. I mean, what's going through their head? I don't know how this is going to end, but it's not going to end well. Clunk. <laughs> Just stand back and watch. And that governor takes a sip. I mean, there's some faith and some confidence there. I don't want to make too much of it. Maybe there was just plausible deniability. They knew they could go. She told me to. Maybe it wasn't faith at all. Maybe it just knew the buck didn't stop with them. But they pour it in. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, just... When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine. When the ruler of the feast that tasted that the offscourings had been made pure. When the ruler of the feast tasted that which was to be, to be cast out into the street was made to that which was good and pleasing when that which was death was made life. But not only that, that which was made through natural occurrence, that which was made through fetching it out of the ground and just washing off into it, that which was made easy, was turned into that which was the very picture and essence of suffering and heartache, the blood of the grape. This is what, this is what the, the governor was given And Nathaniel's sitting there knowing that just days ago he was going, what good thing can come out of Nazareth? And I wonder, I, I just wonder how much of that was pointed back at him going, you know, us of Galilee, there's nothing much for us except fishing and those things that are around it. There's nothing much for us except to be just the the dust of Israel. When Jesus said, a man in whom there is no guile, I wonder if he, like Simon did on the boat, went, no, no, there's, there's great wretchedness in me. I often wonder if he was up to mischief under the fig tree. I, swear, I often wonder that. I often wonder if Nathaniel was actually up to no good under the fig tree. And Jesus said, I saw that. I don't know that, I just wonder. Maybe it was just on a lunch break, I don't know. But I do know that when Peter was confronted with the lordship of Jesus, with the realisation of who he was, he said, depart from me, I am a sinful man. You know what Peter saw himself as? He saw himself as those water pots. What good can I be used for? And here's Nathaniel, what good thing comes out of Nazareth? Quoting that, that which the whole area is thinking, where, Galilee, what is it good for? Nothing's coming out of Galilee. And Jesus said, you want, water? you want wine for a wedding feast? You want wine for a wedding feast? Let me go to the water pots. Your sin, your sin, your shame, your history, your flesh and your failing is no problem to what God wants to do with your life. 
your flesh and your failing is nothing that he's not going to like that does it's not like God oh they did that yesterday now what am I going to do God took the the wash pot and he made it wine and not just any old wine I want you to see what the governor of the feast said. I want, you to, I want to remind you. He tasted the water that was made wine. He knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then what that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. <laughs> oh, you know what your problem is? You're clothed in corruption. That's what your problem is. That's what my problem is. I'm clothed in corruption. I'm mortal. I'm temporal. My mind is captivated by the things of this world. But you know what's going to happen? This corruption will put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. The dead in Christ shall rise, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with Him in the air, and so will we ever be with the Lord. We will be translated into that new life with Christ. Because you know why? Because as far as this world is concerned, they say the best goes first. But Jesus said, what you were born as, as sinful and corrupt, isn't what I want you to be. I have something better. God's in the business of redemption. God's in the business of transformation. You know what? He didn't have to use the dirty water. This is the God that can make the stones and raise up children to Abraham from the rocks. He doesn't need it to be water to turn it into wine. He chose something that was filthy. You know what? He could have just gone... He'd done it before. He could have just looked in one of them jugs and gone, you know what? There's a drop in the bottom of there and it's going to last the rest of the feast. I could even give you some Bible verses as to why that would be a good, a good miracle option to work. But that's not what Jesus did. He went to the filthy. He went to the failing. He went to the off scouring. He went to that which was broken and beaten and used. You know who the Lord's looking to? He's looking to you. And he's going, I want to take you and I want to use you with all of the hurt, with all the pain, with all the suffering, with all the failings in your life. You say, well, you know what? I just need to sit and, and have a few days where I'm not being sinful before God could use me. I'm sorry, we're at a, med a wedding feast. Mary and Jesus and the disciples are having this conversation. They're talking about the fact they're running out of wine. They're looking at the water pots. Meanwhile, old mate with his elbows up to gravy comes along and <laughs> goes back for some more lamb. The water's still moving because of the putridness of what was just dumped in there. And God says, I'll use that. It does not, it does not matter if you beat your wife this morning. God can change you and use you tomorrow. It doesn't matter if you filled your mind all night last night with pornography. God can change you and use you tomorrow. It doesn't matter if you got out of a bed of fornication this morning. God can do a work in your life and He can use you today. Why should you continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. It did not stay filthy water for the feast to drink. God changed it. But it did not matter how putrid it was. It did not matter what scones was sitting at the bottom of those 80 liters. 
God made it good and fit for the Master's use. And He'll do the same for you. It doesn't matter if you're lost in your trespasses and sins, if you're dead and have an evil heart of unbelief, if you come to God and humble yourself before Him and say, here am I, Lord. And run to the Saviour. He will use you. He will create in you a clean heart. Or perhaps you've been saved and you've just fallen from your first love. You've just gotten away from God. And you've been walking in this world. You don't need just your feet washed. I mean, you need your hips down, just cleansed of the mud. You know what Jesus will do? He'll come to you with towel in hand and say, if you confess your sin, I am faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. It ain't a matter of whether you're good enough for God to use. It's a matter of whether God is gracious enough and powerful enough to use you. Do you think you've out God? Do you think you're so broken that God can't fix it? There's nothing happened in your life that could... It's not, it's not like God got up yesterday morning, had a look around Australia, found you, and went, wow, I've never seen that depth of wickedness in the world before. That's some new thing. No, you just... You and I, we're just the same as the rest of the wickedness that this human race has run in for the last 6,000 years. And God's been in the business of redeeming souls ever since the Garden of Eden. And He'll redeem yours this morning. And He'll use you this morning. And, he, and, not, just, and not just make you good, make you best. The best for last. It doesn't matter what heartache's behind you. And I'm not, look, I'm not preaching some prosperity foolish gospel that, oh, God's only got easy roads in front of you. Read the book of Job. Get to know your Bible. But I tell you what this, what the devil meant and used for evil in the past, God will use for good in your life if you let Him. And the hard that is behind you, God will work for good in front of you. Doesn't mean it's easy. Don't even mean it's nice. Just mean at the end of it all, you'll stand before God and the ruler of the feast will say, the rest of this world, they set their best first. But yours was set by the Saviour last and you understand that the bridegroom didn't do that Jesus did that I'm not telling you to turn over a new leaf and make a new start and live the rest of your life better than what you did before that ain't going to do nothing that's just the same ugly leaf turned upside down but if you give it to Christ he'll take it and He'll turn the water into wine. And He'll make you into what, God, what He desires you to be and conform you into His image. <clears throat> and kept the good until now. What good can come out of Nazareth? What good can come out of you? God can use you to achieve His heavenly purpose between heaven and earth, if you just stop and let Him. If you just be done with it all and allow Him to stop you and, and take you, you just, you just got to let God say, okay, you're not a wash pot anymore. You're a vase of wine and I've got a different purpose. But you've got to be willing for the Lord to do that. You've got to be willing for the Lord to change you from the filth into that which is right and pure. 
I'll close with this thought. I'll probably butcher it. A friend of mine sent me a, a, this account. It's just a, a made-up story. Of a young couple that got themselves to the altar. And they got married. And after the wedding and the wedding feast, they were in the car and they were heading off as a happily married couple. They had chosen one another and away they went as husband and wife. Mr. and Mrs. And a little down the road, the new bride turned to her husband and said, Honey, I love you. I'm glad I married you. But right now, I'd like you to drop me back to mum and dad's. I'll come and visit you next week. And he went, that's not how this works, honey. We're together now. We're husband and wife. We've got our home. And she said, no, I understand that and I appreciate that. I appreciate what you did at the altar. Appreciate that and the change of name and, and that now I'm yours and you're mine. But look, I just don't want to do it that way. I just want to live my old life with mum and dad. And I'll just come and see you on Sunday. Around 10 o'clock. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll, I'll just be your bride then. What's the point of the story? Oh, she, she had these things that she was wanting, but there was things she was not willing to let go. There was no repentance. There was no willingness to say, I'm done with that. Now I just want this. I just want this. Don't want anything else. I just want Christ. I just want Christ and whatever He has for me. And that doesn't mean it's not going to get hard. And that doesn't mean you're not going to have tears. And that doesn't mean you're not going to have times where you're going to have to go back to God and go, Lord, I've gone back to being a wash pot and I'm sorry and I want to confess my sin and I want to give it to you that you might cleanse me and use me and set my feet upon a rock and set me right again. But you've got to be wanting Jesus to do the work in your life. There's no good going, well, I'm going to have one foot here and the other foot there because they were no longer wash pots. They were pots of wine fit for the Master's use. And it was Jesus that made them so. You don't have to make yourself so. You don't have to, you don't have to turn yourself into this usable thing. You just have to go to God and say, Lord, will you help me? Will you use me? Will you fix me? I have a sin problem. And I need a Savior. I need you to take my life. I'm done with the old. And I want you to make good with the new. I give it to you. You have something you need to give to God this morning? Maybe you've been saved for 20, 30 years. And you've just gotten a mindset where God can't use you because of this or because of that. Whatever it is, I just want you to see that all it is is something that this world has washed into you. And Jesus can set that right if you just take it to Him. Make you fit for the Master's use. Maybe you need to get saved this morning. For the very first time in your life, you've realized the filthiness that you are. And you need to run to the Saviour. And say, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. What would you have me to do? Whatever it is that the Lord's prompting you to do this morning, can I ask you to do it? We're going to sing a song, just as I am, if I can get a hymn book. You got it there, Nathan? Can you find the number for me? Just as I am, without one plea, that that thy blood was shed for me. NATO will give us the number shortly. 249. Can I pinch your book as well? <laughs>